Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Today, I wanted to do a couple of things regarding feature engineering data science, specifically regarding boost model performance, and some of the things that folks can keep in mind to that last bit of performance out of whatever project they work. So without further ado. Hey, everybody. Thank you for hanging in there for the last presentation of the day. I really appreciate it. I wanted to go over a couple things to help some folks in terms of boosting model performance for getting that last bit of performance out of the modeling project that you're working on, and to be able to uh, specifically focus on feature engineering as we go through. So without further ado, here we go. Let me start with the overall promise that I'd like to give you for this presentation. I have always been really oriented towards making sure that presentations I give have very practical tips to them to make sure that this isn't just theory, that it's things that you have uh, actually been tested so that you don't have to test out what I'm putting in the presentation on your projects and you can learn from the mistakes that I've made in the past. So I'm hoping by the end of this, you'll have a whole raft of different techniques that you can work on for your given project. Okay, so what's our agenda for today? Well, basically we have five main components. One is the background on why we're talking about this. Two, how to work on your modeling strategy. Three, the feature engineering, and this is really the heart of the session. Four, I've got a bonus round on how to combine all these components together. And fifth, I want to leave some time for some questions for the audience. All right, so let's jump right into the background. Why do we care about feature engineering and performance? Well, not to be particularly crass about this, but one of the big features that a lot of people enter the field with is for compensation. Now, this is a survey that was taken a few years ago, but um, you can see that the total average market salary was 161, um, ranging from a base of about 89.2 up to $242,000 a year. Um, that includes a base of 117, annual bonus of 25, annual equity of 53. Now, that's some pretty significant compensation, and that's what a lot of people use as their motivation to enter the field. The challenge is to be able to get these types of compensation ranges, you have to be able to have your models perform. And there are some significant issues in the field that I'm going to cover in a few minutes that explain why it's so challenging to get to that level. of compensation. And that has to do with some research that was actually done by Gartner. For all the fantastic presentations we've had over the weekend, um, one of the big concerns has to do with what's called the hype cycle. Now, this is based on research from Gartner, and it indicates a couple of stages. If you look across the x-axis of this graph, it shows that there are five major stages in any emerging technology, including artificial intelligence. So the first is the innovation trigger. So this is when people really get excited about a new technology. And this is where AI has been for a long time now. But unfortunately, we seem to be moving into the next phase. And the next phase isn't nearly as happy, sadly. Um, you run into your peak of inflated ex expectations, and then you enter what Gartner calls the trough of disillusionment. Now, you may be aware that AI over the years, which goes back all the way to the 1950s, has had what they call two AI winters, where there's a lot of progress in AI and suddenly it stops dead. And then performance doesn't really hit the hopes that people have laid out for it, and it creates some severe problems. If you're in an AI winter, it's extremely difficult to get a new job or to be able to move forward. All right, well, this is all well and good. But what makes me think that we may be entering this type of issue now as opposed to some other time? Well, if you look at research across the industry, there are a lot of things that are starting to concern me. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that VentureBeat indicates that 87% of data science projects never make it into production at all. Now, I don't know too many fields that I'm aware of, that can survive on a 13% success rate. There have been other articles about where's the big data ROI, what's going on. Um, Gartner again in the lower left-hand corner. Why does Gartner predict up to 85% of AI projects will not deliver for CIOs? And then in the lower right-hand corner, 
corner, there's another article about technically right, effectively wrong, why 85% of data science projects fail. So these numbers are fairly consistent. This isn't just one person's opinion. There are a lot of things that are starting to flash some warning signs that I think that we all need to be aware of. Now, one of the things, if you're going to watch out for these types of issues, is you want to make sure that the performance of your model is going to be as high as possible. That kind of follows naturally. And that's what I wanted to sort of walk you through. All right, so I'm going to walk you through specific tips on what you can actually do about this. But where do these recommendations originate from? Well, several years ago, I went through some in-depth studies provided by Kaggle. One of the great things that I found about Kaggle is they, um, in their blog, they frequently go over interviews with the actual folks who have won the competitions. So this is where they essentially spilled the beans on what worked best for them. The second phase of my research project involved 50 in-depth case studies on which factors matter. What was most important? Go in deep. Look at all the feature engineering. Look at the different algorithms that were tested. What actually turned out to be most important? The third and final component was 25,000 head-to-head tests. Now, you may be wondering, how on earth did I come at this number? And it comes from a place of complete and honest paranoia. And that is where this is generating from. When I started in the field, I was very concerned that my models weren't going to work and that my internal and my external clients weren't going to be very happy about it. And so what I tended to do going back as far as the early, excuse me, the mid 1980s, was I was always in a big hurry to test multiple algorithms against each individual project, to test different levels of cross-validation, to test different feature engineering strategies. And what I did is I basically collected the benchmarks of each of those cases to be able to come up with a list of tips that would be useful for other people so they didn't run into the same issues and challenges that I had in the past. So it's all been uh, researched fairly carefully, and that's all well and good, but where has it actually been tested? I mean, do we actually have any results that make this seem to make sense? And I've done the best I could. So you'll probably recognize a lot of the different logos down here of different places where I've been working, either as an employee or as a consultant, to try and boost their model performance. Booz Allen Hamilton, Mercedes-Benz, the FDIC, Morgan Stanley, Citicorp, PayPal, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. I show you this um, basically just to give you a grounding that I really did try my best to come up with a list of use cases that were really going to be helpful for folks. And I've broken this out into two categories. The first set of tips that I'm going to go over is model strategy, the plan, method, series of tactics, or stratagems for building your model. Part two is going to go specifically into data preparation. And this is where we're going to talk about the feature engineering. And I think this is what a lot of people came for. So let's get started. All right. The first thing I'm going to rec- recommend is for us all to go back into time. If you remember a long time ago, um, all the way back in 2015, a whole five years ago, which seems like a generation ago, most of the competitions in Kaggle had more to do with binary classification issues than they did anything else. So you had a situation where um, you had different competitions, both in the KDD Cup and the Liberty Mutual Contest by two different champions. What actually led to them being able to win the contest? And I think they went a bit nuts, to be honest with you. Um, If you look at the KDD Cup on the left, if you see these teeny tiny little boxes, you're not supposed to be able to read them, but just get an idea of the color. Each one of these tiny little boxes was a completely separate model. And the winning solution for KDD Cup had seven feature sets, 64 component models, 15 models in a level one ensemble, two models in a level two ensemble, which all created the final result. That's a heck of a lot of ensembles. So basically, the point I'm trying to make here was the way he got to the top of the competition was combining lots and lots of models together. If you look on the right to the Liberty Mutual contest, you still see that while this diagram is a heck of a lot simpler than the one on the left, that's a heck of a lot of models all being ensembled together to be able to figure out what was going to be the best performance. 
So my first tip has to do with don't assume that a single model is going to provide you everything you need to have. Think about everything from a perspective of how am I going to ensemble all of these pieces together to make my model work? Tip number two, reduce the decision space. Well, what on earth am I talking about here? Well, remember that models are not particularly smart. They're just fast. So when you're working with an algorithm and a data set, you need to be careful in terms of what are you causing the model to do? You want to simplify the problem as much as possible before it reaches the algorithm. You want to make sure that you have done everything possible to remove cases that don't make a whole lot of sense. So in general, let's go over some other basics. What do we already know? What is beyond your influence and which problems can be handled separately? So let's go through this individually. What do you already know? If you already know that there's a certain group of folks that you're going to have to market, let's say you're doing an email campaign, don't include them in the analysis because the decision's already been made. What is beyond your influence? If you are only trying to create an actionable model, you're going to want to figure out what you can't change. Let's say that price is non-negotiable with your marketing team. Including price in the model, you may be able to include it as a predictor, but you're not going to be able to take action on it. And finally, which problems can be handled separately? Do you have a single problem that you're trying to optimize for, or is it multiple problems altogether? The second group over here on the right is marketing. Uh, first thing, seed lists. Is there a group of people that you're going to have to send this to regardless? Your legal department, your compliance department, different state regulatory agencies. Okay, great. You already know that you have to mail to those folks, so take them out of the list that's being used for the model. Let the model concentrate on what it can't figure out. Old, unusable lead sources. If you used to have a significant source of records from Facebook advertising, and you're not doing Facebook advertising anymore, why are you including those records in your model? Because you're not going to be able to use those data sets going forward. Third, what if you have a discontinued market? What if you used to have, uh, let's say, a specific version of your dating site for um, folks 55 and above? And let's say that for whatever reason, you've decided that you're not going to continue them anymore. Well, then don't include them in your data set because the model is going to learn patterns from a market that you're no longer using. Third example, fraud. Let's figure out if we have some folks in safer population. Do you have low dollar thresholds? Are you really concerned about transactions under 10 bucks? Maybe you are, and maybe it's really important, but think about that. Check with senior management before you include those. You may have a list of best customers where regardless of what the fraud risk is, they're VIPs, and senior management has told you that under no circumstances do you put them into a fraud queue. Well, you better pull them out of your analysis. Third, uh, what about higher authentication transactions? What about standing transactions? What about canceled transfers? All these different things can come up in your data set. Do you really want them in there? You want to make sure that you're limiting your analysis to things that you can take action on. Tip number three, if you're familiar with area under the curve, if you look in this box on the web, when you're creating a model, if you see this blue line, anything that's under the blue line is your area under the curve. What most people do in a model, and this is an example from SPSS, people try to optimize their model, and let's go back to the fraud example again, and they want to get the last bit of performance across this whole area. All right, well, the problem is this is great for a Kaggle competition, but let's say that you only have enough budget to be able to handle calling people up to verify for fraud issues for a very small part. Let's say you're only allowed to call it. You only have enough budget to go to 10 percent and back. If you only have enough budget for 10 percent or lower, you're going to want to be able to make your model predict at the 10 percent level. You don't want to optimize all the way out here to the right. And the reason you don't want to do that is because you're wasting resources against an area of the model that you can't act on. If you're limited to 10% of the analysis, then keep it at 10% of the analysis. Use targeted AUC as opposed to total AUC to increase the performance of your model. Tip number four, cross-validation. Now, many of you already know how different validation techniques work, but some of you may not. So let's just go over this brief example. 
On the left-hand side, the traditional methodology is out of your original data set, you take some of your records here as a training set, and you have some of your records as a test set. You're going to want to hold this group out and don't include them in the model for fear of overfitting the data. But in cross-validation over here on the right, you're going to take five different instances and you're going to say, all right, well, I'm going to take 80% of these records in blue and then I'm going to test against the red group. For my second run of validation, I'm actually going to switch it up. I'm going to change which group is in the red and which group is in the blue so that my training and testing changes in each one of these iterations or each one of these folds. Why do we want to worry about cross-validation? Well, you want to make sure that you don't have overfitting of your data and you want to make sure that you don't have leakage. And this is a way to be able to compensate for that. Tip number five, algorithm arsenal. George Box, a famous statistician, once said that statisticians, like artists, have the bad habit of falling in love with their models. And what he meant by that is some of us have a really favorite algorithm. Let's say random forest, which I used as an example before, and I'm going to use again. Have you tested any other types of algorithms against your final data set? If you haven't, you want to make sure and mix it up a little bit. Remember, you've got Bayesian networks, factorization machines, genetic algorithms. There's a blast from the past. Um, gradient boosting machines, logistic regression, neural networks, support vector machines. There are going to be some cases where you can only use one type of algorithm. So, for example, if you've got a P greater than N problem, you're going to want to be using support vector machines. But for a lot of other cases, you could test all kinds of different algorithms against your final outcome. Tip number six, stop making things so complicated. Simplification is important. And here's my rationale for this point. By the way, the quote's on the right. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication attributed to Leonardo da Vinci and Einstein. Everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. So the rationale is complex systems have many more fail points than simple ones. So you want to make sure that if you're going to make sure that your model has the highest prediction value and that it makes it to production, you don't want to do something that's too complicated. Because my second point over here is, if you don't understand it when it works, how are you going to fix it when it breaks? If you're using a truly complicated deep learning process and your data doesn't support it, you can end up with running into a lot of problems that will keep your model from hitting production. So the methodology that I recommend is first, get an understanding of how you want to use your model. And then second, work backward from those constraints to create your modeling strategy. All right, now let's get on to the feature engineering piece, which I think is what a lot of people were making. Tip number seven, remember models like two types of variables most of all. They like straight lines and they like either or situations. So like a binary flag, zero, one, is it true or false? All right, so you wanna make sure that all or as much as you can of your inputs fall into this linear structure, a simple y equals mx plus b. If you have power curves, if you have inverse curves, create a pipeline up front that tests, okay, well, if it isn't a straight linear relationship, what other type of relationship could it be? And can I convert that situation back to being a linear relationship? Well, if you have a continuous input, you can actually code these ahead of time and say, okay, for my given variable, I'm going to test all these transformations and see if I get uh, closer to a straight line because the model is going to handle that better. And you've got some other examples of different types of relationships you could have on the right. Well, you don't have to go through this every single time for every new model. You can actually pre-code a variable pipeline or a feature prep pipeline to be able to create these transitions for you and test through them. Tip number eight, target mean encoding. This is actually one of my favorites. All right, so let's say that we've got categorical inputs and we've got three possible outcomes, A, B, or C. And if our input for a record is an A, we're successful 75% of the time. If our input is B, we're successful 66% of the time. And if our input is C, we have the target that we're after 100% of the time. 
Well, what you do is you take the original features of A, B, or C, and you transition them to what the target mean of the value is. So you could say, all right, every time I see a value of A, I'm not going to stick A in my engineered feature. I'm going to stick the target mean of 75% in there. Every time it's B, I'm going to stick in a value of 66%. Every time it's C, I'm going to put in 100%. This example provided by H2O. All right, so remember that target mean encoding is a feature engineering technique. It isn't a modeling algorithm. But the, transaction, the transition or the mapping from your original input to your mapped feature is pretty simple. All you have to do is calculate a percentage. The tool can be used to transform categorical inputs, but you can also use it for continuous inputs. The, the last point on here is really important. I hear a lot of folks talk in depth about being able to handle null values or outliers or replacing NANDs in their data file. And what you can actually do is you can create a separate category for null values and say, hey, Every time I've got a null value, my average performance is 27%. Then you replace the null values in the original feature with the new engineered feature of 27%. It eliminates the need to remove records. It eliminates the need to get rid of variables that you were worried about before. And it allows for any type of algorithm that may only take numeric inputs to be able to handle um, those values straight on because you can just use those target means altogether as opposed to the more complicated features. All right, now bear with me on this next one. People have given me an unfair reputation. They say I'm a tree hugger because I really like decision trees. But there are lots of reasons why this makes sense. And I want to walk you through an example that says, okay, great. What if we have a continuous input? and we want to convert it. We want to do some feature engineering on this to be able to put it into our final model. All right, so in our original, let's say that in our histogram, we've got values of 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, et cetera, and so forth, or 110 or more. And in a histogram, you're going to get the frequency. How often does this show up? All right, well, for 50 to 60, it has a value of about 30. If you've got a value of 60 to 70, it's going to show up 55% of the time. Great. But the problem is a histogram only gives you a breakout of how many times that value shows up. Wouldn't it be more impactful if we use something else? What if we knew exactly, going back to our target mean example a minute ago, what if we knew that values between 50 and 60 had a percentage of being right for the target 30% of the time. Wouldn't that be a lot more meaningful? Well, one of the things that we've been doing within our organization is to be going ahead and testing decision trees to be able to break out a continuous input and convert this instead of using the histogram into a decision tree for each individual input. What this does is it actually creates essentially a mini model for every single variable in your final outcome. So essentially, your feature engineering has actually become a modeling ensemble technique. You're able to take that something that didn't really have a whole lot of value in terms of the target variable and make it into something really, really meaningful. You then convert the variable through the decision tree, take the results from the terminal nodes, and put them into your analysis. Tip number 10. This is a two-for-one special. There are several things that people skip over in using random forests, which I think is really a shame. Now, it used to be a long time ago that random forest was the number one technique for winning a Kaggle contest. That's uh, since been changed by XGBoost and other gradient boosting techniques. But once upon a time, random forests was one of the best options you could pick for an algorithm to win a contest. Well, that's great. But the problem is, is people forget that when you run a random forest, it actually does a lot of other work for you. So number one is it automatically generates feature importance. Now, why do I care about that? Well, let's say that I want to reduce the number of inputs to my final model. And let's say 
that I'm not really sure how I want to do that. Well, if you take the feature importance that comes automatically out of a random forest, you can choose from each data set that you have, what are the ones that have the most impact? And then only keep those variables in your final analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're able to save a lot of time and trouble by figuring out which inputs to use as opposed to using like a PCA principal components analysis or something like that. Number two, remember that when you're creating a random forest, each one, uh, the random forest is a collection of individual trees, hence the name. That's where the name comes from. All right. So let's say that my random forest has generated a hundred trees and I want to figure out what would be some really good engineered features for my model. Well, remember, the forest is going to remember each one of the individual trees. Well, why don't you take each one of those trees by itself? Because essentially, it's taken a look at your data and said, you know what? If A is true and income's above 50,000 and their uh, hair is brown and they're over six feet tall, whatever the combination may be, it's going to tell you for each one of those values what its relationship with your final outcome is going to be. So it's actually done feature engineering for you. And yet most people are completely ignoring those individual trees, which is really kind of silly because you've already allowed the data to come up with a list. Let's say you have 100 trees. You've got 100 engineered features that you might be able to test in your model, whether your final model is actually a random forest or not. Tip number 11. Go crazy with dates. Now, there are a lot of different projects that you've got dates as individual features in your original data set. But what you may not realize is just sticking the actual date into the model isn't likely to help you all that much. Instead, what you want to do is to be able to say, hey, I've got this date. What other engineer features could I come out of this? So, for example, number one, look at cadence. What's the order of different uh, solicitations I might do? Let's say this is an email campaign. What's the order or the cadence of how quickly I'm going to send email one, email two, email three? But what's the order of that? Similar to that, what's the velocity? How quickly are those emails coming together? Does it make a difference if I've got four days between email one and email two or two days? But if you don't calculate the velocity, you won't know. Third component is date parts. All right, now date parts, you've got what is the actual day, like one through 31. What's the day of the week? Was this a weekday versus a weekend? If you're in retail, this is incredibly important. Was this a holiday or a holiday season versus not holiday? The period before Christmas for US retail looks a lot different than the period in the first week of February. So is it in that season? Do you have hours? associated with each one of your transit transactions. You can bin those together for things like morning, afternoon, evening. Is it commuting time? You're going to have a lot more people um, listening to serious radio, radio during their commute than when they are at work. What about the week of the year, 1 through 52? What about the quarter? What about the fiscal quarter? What are the different elements that your data is telling you? Next one. Is this the end of a calendar period? Now, this came up a lot when I did work in fraud prediction, because if you're doing anomaly detection to figure out fraud, you need to be really careful on whether your date that you're looking at for transactions is the end of the month, the end of the quarter, or the end of the year. Why? Because a large flood of transactions is likely to come through as people try to clean up their balance sheet during those periods. If that's the case, you're going to see a lot more volume. One of the ways to keep that from swapping your model is to create up an engineered feature for each one of those. What about high travel days? Um, in the US, the highest travel day actually isn't the day before Thanksgiving, it's the Sunday after Thanksgiving. But if people are traveling long distances a lot, maybe they're not doing as much retail shopping. Also, they've already been past Black Friday. But any day where you're gonna have a lot of high travel, you're gonna have less retail. What about shopping spikes? You already covered this to some extent, but Christmas, uh, number two holiday after Christmas, believe it or not, is Mother's Day. 
Uh, so take a look at that. What about the date difference? You need to have context when you've got dates. What if you have rolled up a whole bunch of quarters against some event? You're going to want to make sure that you've broken that out so that all the dates in your input file are lower than the date of your target variable or you're going to end up with leakage. So you can really have a field day going through this information with dates. Tip number 12. This is one of the most important one, although it sounds a little woo-woo. It sounds a little out there. But I would like more of us as we create pipelines. Remember, pipelines have a fantastic component in terms of what we do. And I'm all for pipelines. But I think we need to move away from the diagram on the left, where you have a bunch of people you know, in an assembly line just sort of churning things out, and think more towards craftsperson or a watchmaker. Where everyone, where you're taking care of each component individually. Sometimes stuff needs to be handcrafted. Not all the time, but if you try and make the model or your pipeline or your overall pathway towards getting your model and you try and make everything a production line, you're going to end up with lower performance. So if you keep in mind more of the watchmaker analogy, I think you're going to have a lot more success in terms of making sure that you get the results that you're looking for. Now we're going to go for the bonus round. All right. Hang in there with me. This has a lot of steps. This is actually what I put into a patent application, but it's open source for everybody. All right. So one of the things you're going to want to do in step one, remember I talked a couple minutes ago about having univariate tree models. For each individual variable or input, you're going to create a single decision tree, and that's going to be an engineered feature. You're going to take each one of those results from each tree, and you're going to put the results in a common table of values for each node. So let's say the first tree said that there are three different separations based on income. You're now going to have an engineered feature, and the results of each engineered feature versus the target mean is going to go into this table. And you're going to line them up from best performance to worst performance. So now we're going to take our new table and we're going to say, OK, great. From these target means in step two, what are we going to do with that? Well, we're going to calculate a z-score across the entire table. The difference with this z-score versus a typical z-score is it's going to take every value that showed up from each one of our individual trees versus the target variable. And we're going to say, OK, now that we have that, we really have a solid handle on how, what the performance was and how important it is, not just on an individual basis, but across any possibility or combination of factors. Fourth, we're now going to take the results of what we just did in step three, and we're going to create this as a new derived feature. Essentially, you created a mini model for your ensemble out of all the results you had above. Now, you may want to look at that and say, hey, do I have an average, a high, or a low? How important is this variable versus our final outcome? You can create another set of models out of this. Six, you're going to take that whole mess, and you're going to put it into gradient boosting, something like XGBoost, CatBoost, something like that. If you follow this procedure, you will have a way to be able to get the absolute most, at least that I can find, out of all of these categories put together for great tips. Now, don't take what I have given you here as a Bible. Test everything. I don't recommend that you listen to me. I don't recommend that you listen to anybody without testing your results. You know your business. You know your data situation. You know your modeling situation. Make sure that whatever you're going to consider implementing, you have a robust testing methodology to say, hey, did that guy's uh, recommendations make any sense at all? Did this help me at all? If it didn't, don't use it. Always keep a champion challenger process in mind. What did my performance look like before I tested this thing? What does my performance look like after I tested this thing? What's the difference? Should I still be using this? All right. Now, I've tried to leave a whole bunch of time at the end here for questions. But if you want to get in touch with me, the best way to reach me is on LinkedIn. And I'm on LinkedIn as T. Scott Clendaniel. 
or you can reach me at my email address, scottclintdaniel at franklintempleton.com. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that incredible presentation, Scott. Um, now, I am 100% sure that our attendees have loads of questions for you. And for that reason, I'd like to invite you to your very own DSGO Live Q&A session. Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> the way it works is uh, attendees will send questions through the chat. I'll receive them and I'll ask them to you. So attendees, you know what to do. Ask your questions through the chat and, well, we'll receive them and we'll get them answered. Um, so here we have a first question. Um, for handling missing values by creating a categorical, a categorical, a categorical bucket, sorry, for the MV, does this help you analyze the data that is missing completely, uh, non-randomly as, as MCNR, which is particularly difficult to deal with, especially survey data? Um, I, uh, missing data is really important. And if you want to start a bar fight among statisticians, get them all together and ask them how to handle missing values and then just get out of the way because it could get ugly. Um, people have done their entire PhD thesis on how to handle missing or null values. One of the things that I found a long time ago is the fact that a value is missing can actually have information content in and of itself. So let's say that I've gone ahead and I find out that for 15% of my records, it's missing. That may or may not be important. But if I don't flag it, I can't test it in the model to see if the presence of null values make a difference or they don't make a difference. So I, I'm sort of a big believer in throw it all in there and let God sort it out. In other words, um, I'm going to put all these things in there. I'm going to test to see if there's a relationship. And I'm going to be really careful with it. Now, in survey data, the fact that it's missing may or may not be important. It might have been at the end of the survey. If you don't rotate your questions, that's going to have a different component. But the one thing that I'm really against, well, there are two things. One is getting rid of the record or the column altogether because you lose a lot of information value that way. And the second thing is I don't believe in imputing values if you're not sure that that value would have existed in the first place. So just assigning the mean value for somebody's response on a survey, I don't think is a really great idea. I would much rather say, hey, for everyone who didn't respond to this particular question, this is how often the target showed up and use that value. So um, it may not be as robust as other ones for from a pure statistical point of view, but it certainly helped me out in a lot of models. OK, OK, wonderful. Thank you so much for that thorough answer. Now, we have another question coming in, this time from Lucas. Lucas asks, would you correct bias when feature engineering within each node or before when cleaning the data set? Uh, clean the data set before. Okay. Um, absolutely. Also, you have to be really careful. Trees are very greedy. You need to be, first of all, my general rule of thumb is never go below five levels in a tree. Two, you've got to make sure that you have a fairly robust sample size in each terminal node. So you want to make sure that there are lots and lots of records in there. You don't want it to be working so either restricted on the way down or you're pruned on the way back up. But you have to do one of those two techniques or um, trees will overfit the data. And that is not what you want. So be very careful. OK, OK, awesome. Well, Lucas, I hope that answered your question. Now, we have a question coming in from Miguel. Miguel asks, uh, Mr. Clendaniel, can you share which one was the latest Kaggle or public contest you joined and what were the main takeaways? Jeez, um, I don't participate in Kaggle. I read what everybody else did on Kaggle. <laughs> um, uh, Kaggle is a great learning resource, um, but a couple things. One, most of the stuff I work on are, real, are business problems like did people respond or not? Were they a credit loss or not? Were they a fraud or not? Um, so sort of old school classification questions. Um, being able to find the bunnies in the YouTube videos um, is not a situation that I encounter a whole lot. But there is a huge um, push in towards the Kaggle competitions 
to do things in terms of pattern recognitions with images, with videos, um, any type of computer vision problem. And that just isn't my area of expertise. So two things. One, I never really participated in them a whole lot. I like to read what everybody else did. Um, and two, what the current problems are really aren't my wheelhouse. So if I did participate, I would probably get my doors blown off. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank At you. At so least much. I'm honest. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, we value, we value honestly, honesty all that well. Um, now, we have a question now coming in from Sam. Sam asks, where can we read more about your patented technique? Uh, um, you can send me a note on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, I... <laughs> That's probably the easiest way, because it was part of it was going to be part of a patent application. I really wasn't putting it out there a whole lot. But um, uh, what I've discovered is that you can't defend process patterns very well anyway. So even if I got the pattern, it was going to cost me a ridiculous amount of money, and I couldn't do anything when I finished with it. So yeah, that's what happened with that. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, now we have a question, in, a question coming in from Viren. Um, question is, how does one do cross-validation on a model prepared after over or under sampling on an, unbalanced, on an unbalanced data set, so like 90 can? Oh, yeah. Um, it's a pain in the neck is the short answer. <laughs> so the first, thing, <laughs> the first thing you want to do is um, if you've got an imbalanced uh, data set, for the model building, you're going to want to balance it. So if I've got a binary classification, I try to make sure that everything is 50-50 before I do um, the modeling up front. All right, so the model is therefore going to have results on the 50-50 basis. And I basically do the cross-validation on, um, so let's say I broke it into five pieces. I take five pieces from the 50-50 data set and do the cross-validation on that. And then I just translate the calculation in terms of, okay, great, yippee. Um, what would their, uh, the final validation have been if I hadn't taken a 50-50 sample? But uh, so do the 50-50 first, do the cross-validation there, and then translate the calculation across to the original data set. All right, all right, wonderful. Well, Brent, I hope that answers your question. It's a very Unless nice it's a Tuesday or and the moon is full. It, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> It does start to get complicated. I, I understand that. <laughs> well, it makes sense. It makes sense. Some, sometimes unseen forces just tend to... Yeah, you know, there you go. What we're doing. <laughs> well, now we have another question coming in, this time from Kevin. Kevin asks, how do you balance subjectivity with objectivity? Um, there are, it's complicated. Uh, one of the things that I'm a big believer in is uh, testing as many things as I can. So uh, you guys have heard of the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion, uh, who's sitting in the room. So the senior boss says, I am absolutely positive that Greenland is causing all of our problems. Like, okay, um, maybe, I don't know. Um, one of the things that I try and do is, you know, I absolutely put a feature in there for Greenland. But I don't put it in the final model if it doesn't hold up. So one of the ways to get to closer objectivity is to make sure that you've tested lots and lots of stuff. Um, and you need to be really careful with how you sampled your data in the first place. Um, so for subjectivity, sometimes you've got business rules that are just subjective. But that's the problem you're solving, so you have to incorporate those. Objectivity, um, large numbers of features, large data sets. OK, OK, wonderful. Well. Kevin, I really hope that answered your question. Um, now, we have another question this time coming in from Diego. Diego is asking, what is the main benefit of including date as the week order, so 52 to give an example? Is it to assess some season factors and how to manage it as a data type? You can, um, it may or may not be helpful. I'll be honest with you, week of the year is probably not one of the ones that shows up the most for me. Uh, what it does, however, allow you to do is if you convert it into weeks and then you bin them with target meaning coding, it gives you some type of idea of how far into the year you were. Um, I think you're going to a lot more success with a lot of the other features. I was just trying to do a laundry list of different things that you could look at. Um, 
I don't see it showing up a heck of a lot, but it gives you an idea of how far into the year you are. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, if you took the week of the year from a fiscal quarter point of view, you would have an idea of how far the business was in that fiscal quarter. So let's say each quarter is 13 weeks because budgets tend to be driven and uh, funds tend to be made available by how far into a given quarter a corporation has been. So it's helpful in those type things, but that's more at the margins. Okay, okay, awesome. Now, um, we have another question coming in, this time from Christoph. Christoph is asking, will automated feature engineering take over the manual one? I, I wish. Um, I am not one of those people who says, who is against auto ML. I am against the fact that it tends not to work all that great. Um, I don't think of, I think auto ML's best application is like tuning hyperparameters because that's just a slog and there isn't a whole lot of intuition on hyperparameters that I found particularly helpful. So it's great for that. In terms of feature engineering, there are aspects of it, like taking the trees out of the random forest and doing features that way that's helpful. Doing the univariate decision trees on individual inputs, I think that can be automated. Um, I still think there's a role for the human, and I'm happy to be proved wrong. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, um, I think that pretty much is all the time we have for the questions. Um, and. I have to say thank you once again for sharing with us such a such an thank insightful you guys for hanging Scott. In here with me. It was awesome. It was a pleasure hosting you, and I have to say it was an amazing way of finishing off these presentations. So thank you once again. Thanks, guys.